it seems obvious that there's intelligent civilizations out there. Now, I don't know what intellig- how to define intelligence, but there's beautiful complexity. Like when you look at a, I j- I've looked at enough cellular automata, which is a very primitive mathematical construction that when you run, complexity emerges. I've looked at that enough to know that it just seems like there's complexity everywhere out there. So I, that's why I'm deeply puzzled by the, the Fermi paradox. It makes no sense to me. Uh, I mean, uh, I have trivial answers to it. Why haven't aliens at scale not shown up? I, I think the, the, the two possible options for me is either we're too dumb to see it. They're already here. They've been talking to us through processes we just don't understand. Like, like what we experience as uh, life here on Earth is actually they're everywhere. Conscious aliens could be consciousness. That when we feel love for one another, that could be aliens. When we, I don't know, or feel fear or whatever, that could be aliens. I have to agree with you. None of this is scientifically provable right now. We we talked a little bit already about that, but I would say that I do not adhere to the Fermi paradox because it's very anthropological. Uh, morphic. It's, you know, sure. it's an interesting exercise. Let's put it that way. But it's a typical example of seeing the universe through our own eyes. And uh, this is where the limitation is. Understanding what's going on with complexity, as you said, and looking at the biophysical model and theories for the nature of life, I would agree that probably This extraterrestrial message is all around us. We're not yet capable of picking it up. But I think, unfortunately, even though that makes me sad, the way to pick it up is by studying life here on Earth, doing some of the science you're doing, better understand the nature of life until you realize, uh, holy crap, the thing I was looking for all along has been has been here all along. Right? Well, you know, enough. a good example of that, and it doesn't need to be. Um, an extraterrestrial civilization. Look at something that I really, you know, whether or not it's real, I don't care because in terms of intellectual exercise, I think it's fantastic. Look at the shadow biosphere. The idea that life didn't appear only once on Earth, but there were many different pathways of it. And today we know and we study the tree of life that led to us, from Luca to us. And the shadow biosphere is telling us that there is, or there are other pathways that came up at the time where life originated, but they are so different that we cannot recognize them as being living. And we cannot pick them up in our test, because our tests are being built to recognize life as we know it. And for me, again, I don't know if this theory will be verified or it would be discredited, but what I like about it is that it forces me to think on how do I look for life? I don't know. So that starts here on our planet, not even with little green men, uh, it starts with very simple life that be, can be so different that it might be just right in front of our nose and we don't see it. So that probably starts with the, the scientific humility of always realizing that we might be too biased in our understanding of what is the phenomena we're trying to study. Yeah, I don't like the term bias because it involves some moral connotation. That you sure. know, uh, I'm but using I understand in the, the bias sense, in, ter- yes. in terms of scientific yes. uh, pathway, intellectual framework. Definitely. What do you think about the UFO sightings? So the widespread experiences that people have in seeing different phenomena that they sort of, that are mysterious, mm-hmm. that people project ideas about whether it's aliens or not, but they can't explain it. And there's pictures and data and then the government is involved in releasing footage and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And that seems to captivate the public. It always, imagination. Uh, it, it always do. I mean, you know, there are a number of things that uh, captivate people 
especially children, actually, dinosaurs and aliens. Still a child. Yeah, we are also a child at heart. And um, so about UFOs, I am a scientist and I'm a citizen. So I'm going to tell you a couple of things. First, I don't mind talking about that at all, because I think as a scientist, this is extremely interesting, because the thing I don't know, I want to learn about it. This is more knowledge. So we all know the statistics about UFOs. 95% of them are just natural phenomenon or things that are being misinterpreted. We know that. Uh, then you have the 2% that might be secret programs by whatever government uh, it's out there. Another percent, say, is about natural phenomenon that we don't know about yet, that we cannot explain. And then there is this tiny percentage that don't fall into all these categories of thing. And I think that the re the report about the UAPs falls into the same kind of uh, scheme, except that now they have at least some patterns of speed of other things uh, that were in the report. Today, we don't know if these sightings are part of military program or actual UFOs. Um, I always run into that question because, of course, as the director of the Carl Sagan Center at the SETI Institute, I received a number of emails about the subject. People are actually okay. confused about what the SETI Institute is. We are not studying UFOs. Uh, we are studying, we are actually looking for messages. The way I put it, you know, usually is that we are studying extraterrestrial in their natural habitat. <laughs> yes. And and the UFO people are trying to understand whether they invaded our aerial space. Yes. So this is very two very different things. And unfortunately, <laughs> over the years, I actually respect very much people who are trying to go to the bottom of what UFO are following some very scientific ways of doing this. They are very very credible agencies doing this. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there is a folklore around UFOs. And this has been a huge disservice to the scientific community. And this is why you have been having that much pushback for a long time by the scientific community, because no congressman in the world wants to tell their taxpayer that they are supporting something that looking for flying saucers and, you know, mm -hmm. when you see what's happening, it's terrifying. And I am actually concerned, you know, uh, about that relationship that people do between folklore and real search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, in fact, it's been so bad that until today, uh, there is no government agency that is actually funding the SETI search. It is a private funded endeavor. What NASA funds right now, which is a progress, is a search for techno signature, which means that when you are looking at the atmosphere of a planet, you look for some disequilibrium that could tell you that something is there. But it's not going to fund a, uh, an institute or whatnot that is looking for messages or, 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 or other things like that. Does that just have to do with the taboo associated with the folklore, as you yes. said? Yes, and I think there was a pushback from the political uh, arena decades ago about that. At the time where all the flying saucer were coming out, uh, and then the SETI Institute got it started. So, um, But now there is more of a willingness to look at the UAP uh, UFO uh, a phenomenon from a scientific standpoint. So much so that the government is actually seeking some help from a scientific institution. And there are programs to start looking into those phenomena. And as a scientist, I am interested. What I'm not interested in, again, Carl Sagan comes back here. I don't want to believe. I want to know. And so to know, you have to have a uh, real experiment, you have to have observation, and you have uh, uh, things that are done the right way. I don't want to have somebody that starts with what if as a question and then turns this what if into the only argument and the only conclusion there so, is. You understand what I'm but saying? But still, I think it's valuable to appreciate the mystery 
and not deny the mystery. So no, the mystery is there. But what I don't want is people taking advantage of the public and making money out of folklore. Well, let me flip that. I, I understand, but so there is a folklore in like the stuff I do, AI and robotics, for example. There's a clear fear, Terminator and movies and all those kind of stuff. You could say that I'm very concerned about this miscalibrated uh, understanding of the public of what robots role are in society. Or you could see it as a, let's use a metaphor of a wave. You can say this giant wave that we'll call folklore is a really bad idea. We need to uh, avoid it. We need to hide. We need to build dams. Or you can be a surfer and ride the wave as a scientist. You, it, it, there, to me, the fact that people are wondering about the mystery of UFOs, it means they're wondering. No, they are. But the thing, I, I, I will stop surfing that wave when it comes back to bite an entire scientific discipline. When it hurts the science, sure. For now, the past 60 years, we were not able to raise money uh, from the government, no grants. It's a discipline that has no postdoc or very little postdoc just because there is a fear of that folklore on the political arena. People don't want to be associated with that because they confuse the two. So I stop there. And as the director of the Carl Sagan Center, I am just very happy to see now that there is a course correction in the government seeking scientific investigators for this kind of issues. And hopefully that will right the ship there. I love it. I love to see it. But I want, and I love our little disagreements. I'm, I'm doing so obviously respectfully and with love and it's just, <laughs> it makes it a, for a fun conversation. But I, I think, you know, just like with surfing a wave, there, there, there's some level of, the more you resist it, the worse it is. So I- well, We didn't resist it. Yes. It, it didn't it come from us and we paid the price. I just think that the role of a scientist in part in the 21st century, when we talk about social media, is to direct this sense of wonder that people have into a direction of the rigors of science. I think we do that pretty well. I would disagree. I don't I would, think SETI so. SETI does much better, but there's other places in science where- The search si for life is fairly, a fairly easy place to you know, draw the wonder of people. Yes, right? Because yes, it, it's a profound question that pretty much everybody has. But I think I just want to highlight the fact that I think a lot of scientists, my colleagues, friends, think that all you need to do is science. All you need to do is this, the, the scientific process, the peer review process, the, the, the data, and so on. But I think communication is actually a fundamental part of the process. Oh, yeah. Um, because it has to do with funding, but it also has to do with like we're we're a bunch of humans trying to ask big questions, trying to figure this whole puzzle out. And I totally agree. We do have more public presentation at the institute than peer-reviewed articles. And believe me, we have lots of peer-reviewed articles. So our scientists are out there and they are sharing the wonder of discoveries. And it's so easy these days. I mean, there is not one day. Tell me about writing a book right now about the search for life in the universe. I mean, it's almost every single day I had to correct something <laughs> in the chapters I was writing. So SETI, in terms of both signatures and signals, is a pretty active Field. So it's getting better right now. Uh, it's getting better. Uh, but remember that the SETI Institute is not only about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. This is the root of uh, the historical root of the Institute. But it's about 10% of what we do. In fact, we are searching for life in the universe from the origins of life to extraterrestrial intelligence. So 90% of everything else is exoplanet. Uh, for instance, we have a good chunk of the Kepler team that is actually uh, with uh, the SETI Institute, and they are working with TESS right now. Some already have some time on the GEMS web. We have astrobiologists, we have astronomers. And those are looking for data, for signals, for planets out there go outside of our solar system. Yeah, go to analog places to try and understand the type of life that survive in planetary type environments. I mean, people are always surprised when I tell them, you know, whatever flies in the solar system has flown or will be flying, we're involved. 
So this is not something that pops in everybody's mind when they are thinking about the, the SETI Institute, because we started off as the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. But the Institute has really bloomed into uh, the search for life along the Drake equation, all the terms of the Drake equation. Just to clarify, because by the way, you're saying a bunch of terms, sometimes it's good to return to the basics. When you're saying whatever's flown, SETI is a part of the things that yeah. are flown. So we, because we're using we elusive sometimes, we say we humans and sometimes we SETI. Yeah. So the SETI is, is really broadly involved oh, in yeah. a lot of the fingertips reaching out there towards the stars. Think about Mars involved in landing site selection in instruments that are actually on board. Some of the mission in science teams, for instance, uh, Cassini, uh, New Horizon, also missions that will be coming. It's the search for life, we do this all across the Drake equation. So uh, SETI is part of it, and it's uh, our route, and it's expanding a little bit right now. We hope it will continue to expand. So this is this is a good time uh, for the Institute. And it also, uh, in my mind, was the very first Astrobiology Institute because we have this multidisciplinary uh, approach where I can bring many of the scientists from different domains and disciplines to think about a question. And as you know, discoveries happen at the nexus of disciplines. And uh, it's really a privilege when, when you are in an institute like that. 